nominating committee is in the process of selecting a, a recommendation for Elder. We have a vacancy starting in January. It's coming January. So if you would like to be an elder, or you know somebody that would like to be an elder, we ask that you can contact me. Just to remind you that if you're going to nominate someone else, make sure you've coordinated with him before you turn your name in. Second announcement is Outreach Committee is sponsoring a blood drive on Wednesday, May the 25th, between 12.30 and 5. If you can and are willing to donate blood, please come to the Fellowship Hall. If you would like to coordinate ahead of time and make an appointment, an actual appointment for your blood donation, go online to Red Cross Blood Dark Order and you can make an appointment online at that time. Do you need to put up? Chair, I believe you have something. Good morning. Please uh, take a moment and look at your bulletin insert. Um, on one side, it says this month's prayers and praise. And on the back side, it says this month's prayers and praise continue. This is what I'm calling your attention to today with this announcement. Um, just some background information, first of all. A subcommittee with members from the Communications Committee and the Congregational Ministry Committee met to study the current weekly prayer concerns email. Our assessment was that most of the prayer requests were for ongoing, long-term health situations. Sometimes people go on the list and stay for years. There seemed to be little need to update a rather static list each week. Session agreed with our assessment and recommended to modify the current prayers concerns email into a prayers and praise monthly email. It will include birthdays and anniversaries for the month, along with the ongoing prayer requests. And as you can see, it's going to be printed once a month in the Sunday Bulletin. If you are already receiving the current prayer concerns email, you will automatically receive this new monthly prayers and praise email. You don't need to do a thing. However, there are situations where there's an urgent need for prayers and support, which can't wait. Again, session agreed with our recommendation for timely emails, which will be called the YPPC Prayer Chain. If you wish to receive the prayer chain, you will need to request that you be added to the distribution list. This will not happen automatically. Also, please be aware that depending on the situation, receiving the prayer chain may result in getting multiple emails during the week and not just on Wednesdays. There are several ways to sign up. This week on Wednesday, you got a special email about the changes to the prayer ministry, and at the bottom there was a button. And all you have to do is click on that button that says, Add me to the YPPC prayer chain. That brings up an email, an email to Lynn Mercer. Fill it out, hit send, and you're done. The same button also exists on the weekly update that you received on Friday. Again, just fill it out and hit send. Or, in today's bulletin, there is a card to fill out and turn in. Put it in the offering plate, give it to an usher, and you will be added to the prayer chain. You only need to do one of these. Whichever one works for you, do it. If you have any questions or if you need assistance of any kind, please talk to Reverend Smith or myself during fellowship today, and we'll be glad to help you out. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Are there any other Do you have a minute to vision? Oh. Okay. Oh. You ready for this? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Mother's Day next week. Every Mother's Day, 
we have the privilege of a special offering for the Somerville Presbyterian Home. And really, there are six homes that we support. Um, our Presbyterian Church does wonderful things, not only for children with Thornwell, but for seniors at six homes that are available. There are six communities in South Carolina. There are about 900 seniors living in these communities of all faiths. They have patio homes, apartments, cottages, and the collection that we take up next week is for those whose funds have run out. Do you know for no reason of their doing, but they've lived so long, usually always in their 90s, and they have no more funds. And the Presbyterian homes, these six locations, do not want to turn them away. So the funds that we give next week will help to ensure that those people will always live out their home, their life, in one of those six homes. In those homes, there are private rooms or larger multi-room suites. Um, they have memory support in three of the homes in Easley, Columbia, and Florence. They have respite stays for those who are taking care of people in their homes and need someone to look after them so that they, those people can go on vacation. Um, there are assisted living accommodations, it's memory support, skilled nursing care. All of these things, our church has made sure that seniors are looked after. So I ask that you think about your contribution <coughs> next week and give so that the people who are in these homes, whose funds have run out, that they will still remain there for the rest of their life.
Lord, your most holy place. Like David, we can lift our hearts to the Lord and trust that God hears our cries to mercy. Join with me in the use of prayer and confession found right in your bulletin in the silent time that follows. Let us confess our sins mildly before you. Lord, Lord save us from ourselves. We continue to do the same things over and over, expecting a different results. Lord, save us from doing too much. We go fishing every day, not noticing the way Lord, you know I love you. And do you know what 
Jesus told Peter to do to show Jesus he loved him? He said, take care of my sheep. Now, do you think he meant sheep that go bad? Yeah. No. But what he meant, remember, Jesus said he is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. So what Jesus was saying is that if we love Jesus, even though we might not be able to give Jesus a hug right now, we can take care of God's people. You can help others. You can be kind. You can show God's love. And no matter how those people respond, even if they aren't real excited about it, guess what? It doesn't matter. Because we're doing it to show Jesus we love him. Because if you've ever been nice to someone and they weren't nice back, that's happened to me and it's kind of frustrating. But Jesus says, that's okay. You just keep taking care of people and loving people because when you do that, it shows me that you love me. And the more we love people, the more God's heart is filled with joy because God knows that that's how we show our love for God. All right, let's pray. Holy God, Holy God. thank you for today. Thank you for today. And this time together. And this time together. We love you. We love you. You know that. You know that. Help us. Help us. To love your people. To love your people. And take care of them. And take care of them. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, and in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stay with me for the first reading of God's word, which is Psalm 30, defined on page 505 in the front portion of your pew Bible. Listen to God's word for you. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up, and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I have cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved by your favor, O Lord. You had established me as a strong mountain, you hit your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there? In my death, if I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me, O Lord, my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
page 115 in the back portion of the New Testament in your Pew Bible. Friends, listen to God's word for you. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, as, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, break, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. A hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were young, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Well, today is the third Sunday in the season of Easter. You remember last week, it's going to stay Easter in here for the 50 days following Resurrection Sunday. And so today we are back in John's Gospel with a very long reading. And this Sunday I read most of what is known as the epilogue, um, chapter 21. And like most epilogues, this is the part where the author ties up the loose ends. Like the previous stories that we have of Jesus' resurrection appearances, this week's lesson has a very personal account of the impact that the resurrection will have on God's people. The stories that we have from John of Jesus' interaction with Mary Magdalene, with the disciples who were locked away up in the upper room, with Thomas, the special appearance he made just so that Thomas could see and believe. Each of these stories gives us an intimate glimpse into what happens when God's people encounter the risen Christ. Now, throughout John's Gospel, if you go back to the beginning, you'll see that we have a combination of what John calls signs. These are those miracles that Jesus performs that are a sign that show Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And coupled with those signs, we have these stories, these narratives of his personal interactions. And it's between Jesus and people who are struggling to see the signs. 
They're struggling to understand who Jesus is. Now that pattern, if you notice, in some ways it holds true with our lesson that we have today. As we have done throughout John's Gospel, we will see a sign that shows us who Jesus is. And then we see ourselves as we step into the shoes of those people who have encountered Christ. In the three scenes we have in today's resurrection story, we see the sign of the disciples' abundant catch of fish. And then we get to come alongside Peter as Jesus restores Peter back into his role as Jesus' disciple. But this story is different from the others in one respect. You see, instead of this interaction showing us who Jesus is, it actually helps us to discover what it will mean to be a disciple of the risen Christ when he is no longer physically here. In Peter's interaction with Jesus, we see that being his disciple as we are today means being someone who loves Jesus, someone who cares for God's people, and someone who is willing to follow the example that Jesus set. Now, last Sunday, we finished what scholars believe to be the end of John's Gospel as it was originally written. We read, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So apparently, everything that was written as of last week was enough so that we could know that Jesus is the Messiah, so that we could have eternal life. But there were these nagging questions that needed to be answered in the early church. What happened to Peter, after all? Peter is that one disciple. He was there. He encountered the risen Christ in the upper room, but the last interaction we have between him and Jesus is when he boldly proclaims that he will die for Jesus and then subsequently goes on to deny being his disciple three times. Now, the early readers of John's Gospel knew about Peter. They knew that he had been restored and that he had led the early church. But what they nor we would know is how that came to happen, unless this chapter was added. And so as the first scene of our story opens, Peter is getting antsy. Now, I'm pretty sure that if Peter were alive today, doctors would at least evaluate him for ADHD. <laughs> Let's just say impulse control isn't Peter's strong suit. And so as we arrive today on the shores of Tiberias, I can picture Peter pacing with that nervous energy of an ADHD boy. Jesus had breathed on them in the upper room. He had given them the Holy Spirit and told them that he was sending them out the same way he had been sent. He gave them the ministry of forgiveness. And now what? It appears that the disciples were still waiting. What would it mean to be sent? And so what do you do when you're waiting for a divine directive? Well, in today's passage, we see that an acceptable answer is go fishing. <laughs> go fishing. That's not what I do, but my husband would appreciate that. Now, I have to say I am thankful that this story was added to John's Gospel. This one little scene is a great reminder that being a disciple means that you are going to do a whole lot of what we church people like to call ordinary time. When we read those stories from the Bible, it's easy to forget that what we have captured are the stories that were worth preserving, a redemptive history. There was a whole lot that happened between those stories. Even the disciples had to work to put food on the table. Even the disciples got antsy. Even the disciples were probably frustrated because their efforts didn't seem to produce any fruit. And so we see in our story that the disciples fished all night long, as was the custom of the day. 
But as the sun starts to rise, they have caught nothing. Left to their own devices, the disciples were getting nowhere. This is the point where John cuts to the second scene. A stranger appears about a hundred yards off a football field's length away. I think it was probably still that dark time of the morning, just as the sun was rising. Nobody could tell who it was when he called out, Children, you have no fish, have you? And tells them that if they would just throw their nets on the other side of the boat, they'd be sure to catch some fish. Well, the disciples were not nearly as snarky as I might have been after a night without fishing, or they had gotten used to strange things happening over their three-year journey with Jesus because they did what the stranger said. And in their obedience, they received a catch so abundant that they couldn't even haul it into the boat. It was like the wine at the wedding feast or the loaves and fishes with the multitude. Once again, these disciples are witnesses to the extravagant, abundant grace of God that Jesus offers people who will trust him. And while they still cannot see him, the disciple Jesus loved has an inkling, and he tells Peter, it is the Lord. And so our focus now shifts to Peter, the disciple who was never prone to think first and act later. He decides to put on some clothes, because that's what everyone does before they go swimming. And he swims to shore, leaving everybody behind to carry the heavy nets. Bless Peter's heart. He may not be practical, but he was certainly passionate. Now, a friend of mine likes to call these types of episodes in our modern-day times God things. That's the term she uses to describe these small scenarios that have the same results. There are times when we're just going about our ordinary lives, doing things as we always do, when all of a sudden something happens to remind us that no matter where we are, we are never going it alone. In some way, God will intervene, whether it is small or great, but we experience that goodness of God's extravagant grace. As I mentioned in last week's sermon, one part of being a disciple means we need to have those resurrection eyes, the eyes that are open so we can see the way that God is acting to give us those opportunities that will sustain our faith. Now, the rest of the disciples arrive on shore and pull in their nets with 153 <coughs> large fish, fishermen large. They must have been like this big. <laughs> and then Jesus feeds the disciples' bodies and their souls in a scene that must have brought back so many memories of the many meals that they had shared throughout their time together. It was there, right on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, it's also the Sea of Galilee, where most of those disciples were first called to follow Jesus, where they made that commitment to follow him that changed the trajectory for the rest of their life. As they shared the loaves and fish, their minds must have gone back to the time that Jesus took just two fish and five loaves of bread and fed thousands of people with 12 baskets to share. Seeing Jesus hold the bread must have taken them back just a few weeks earlier to the upper room where Jesus said, This is my body, broken for you. This scene reminds us as modern-day disciples of the importance of those rituals and rhythms of our life that remind us and connect us where we are to where we have been. The way that we see that God has been with us through it all. This scene invites us to step away from the busyness of our lives and allow Jesus to feed our souls as we intentionally spend time with God. Being a disciple means spending time being fed and resting with the Lord. Now, it wasn't all kumbaya there around the campfire, because sometimes an experience can bring back a painful memory. It was only three chapters earlier in John 18 when Peter gathered around another campfire outside the high priest's house, and he denied being Jesus' disciple three times. 
being back around the campfire, this time with Jesus right there in front of him, I imagine it must have brought back that painful scene from Peter's life. The final scene of today's reading reminds Peter of who he is, despite his denial or feelings of unworthiness. Peter is Jesus' disciple. He is the one that was invited by Andrew to come and see the Lord, the one that Andrew was sure was the Messiah. He is the one that Jesus named Peter, or Rock. When some of the disciples decided that Jesus' teachings were way too tough to follow, Peter is the one who said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Was Peter the one who denied Jesus three times? Yes. Did that cancel out everything else about Peter and his relationship with Christ? No. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And three times Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Each time Jesus commands Peter to take care of his sheep as a result of that love. In the same way that Jesus had connected loving God to loving our neighbor in the greatest commandment, here we see that being a disciple who loves Jesus means we must be a disciple who cares for Jesus' people. We cannot separate those two from one another. Now, the thing about tending sheep is that sometimes tending sheep is a thankless and dirty job. You see, sheep aren't like cats. You can't just put out a litter box and some food and trust that they'll figure things out. Sheep need constant attention, protection, direction, and care. And so being a disciple means we love Jesus. But that expression of love is in our care for his people, especially those vulnerable lambs cannot care for themselves. <clears throat> well, our story closes as Jesus gives Peter an ominous prediction about his death and then says, follow me. Being a disciple means following the example of Christ, even when that example might lead us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow down a path that we would not choose for ourselves. Peter will always be my favorite <coughs> disciple, mostly because I find great comfort in the fact that God used Peter despite himself. So there's hope for all of us yet. This story of his call to be a shepherd of God's people is especially near and dear to me as one who is called to be a pastor. The reminder that I can't separate my love for Jesus and Bible study from my care for God's people is something I always need to hear. However, friends, I have some news. This story isn't only for what my dad likes to call the professional Christians among us. This story is for all of us who call ourselves disciples. Being a disciple means loving Jesus, caring for his people, and following Jesus' example. Following him, we are going to experience some ordinary day-to-day -day life. There will be times when we are antsy and we're just struggling to figure out what God wants us to do next. There will be times when we don't see any results despite how hard we might work. There will be other times when we experience the abundant grace of God as a surprise. There will be times when we deny or doubt our identity as a disciple, and we need to be reminded what it means to bear Christ's name into the world. I am so thankful for this epilogue to John's gospel. The sign of the abundant catch at the break of dawn, and a long night with no results. The time where Jesus sat to break bread and be reminded of the ways that Jesus provided for his disciples, Jesus' questions and his commands for Peter, all that goes into these three scenes are given to show us how amazing God's grace is in Jesus Christ and to show us who we are called to be as we follow him 
as his disciples in modern times. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Lord, we pray for all of our children and our teachers as they are nearing the end of another school year. Give them stamina and perseverance. May they celebrate all that they have done together during this very strange year with COVID and all of the challenges, the ways that they have just done amazing things in their determination to learn and to grow. We lift up all of the people who are hungry, whether their hunger is physical, spiritual, or emotional. Those who are weighed down by heavy burdens of grief and doubt. We pray that you will help us to see our neighbors through your eyes, that like Jesus, we will see your people as sheep who need a shepherd, and that we will point them to you. And now together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. where we are invited to participate as we respond to the abundant grace of God by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to our care.
Peter. And we reflected on the fact that really the main difference between the two disciples is that Peter came back. Both denied Jesus, both betrayed Jesus, but Peter came back. Aren't we glad that God welcomes us as God's disciples, that we can follow Jesus and care for his people, trusting that no matter how much we've messed up, we love the Lord and we are his disciples. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and grant you peace this day and forevermore.